Welcome to Foundations of Knowledge and Action, Understanding Trans and Non-Binary Identities. This is our essentially Trans and Non-Binary 101, and we've got a lot of great content to talk with y'all about. My name is Ark Telos Saint Amor, which can be a mouthful, so most folks call me Tay. My mandatory pronouns are they, them, there, and I'm going to be your trainer facilitator today. A little bit about me, I'm neurodivergent, I'm queer and trans, I'm a victim survivor, and I'm Mexican indigenous, I'm Coatecan. I also went to business school for some odd reason, so I have my BBA in entrepreneurship and general management. I'm also in grad school, I'm wrapping up my master's and hoping to excel that into my PhD program. I am in uh, receiving an MSW, master's of social work, while also receiving an MS um, in uh, criminal justice. Uh, I have 20 years plus of direct DEI and justice work and business management experience, which horribly dates me. Um, and I'm the executive director of Youth Move National, which we'll talk about more in a moment. Now, why do I share these things? I do not share these things to idolize myself, although I am fantastic. But I do that because I'm assuming that we are gonna have some great participation today. Y'all may have some questions. I may have some answers, and I just really want to preface that the information you're getting today is from my own perspective, and this is the lens in which that is funneled through. I do not have right answers for you folks. I do not. You ask me a question, you are going to get a Tay answer and a Tay answer alone, right? We are not monoliths. We are not singularities. I cannot speak on behalf of literally every member of the queer and trans community, right? I can only speak on behalf of myself, my own lived experience, my identities, my communities, my personal and my professional and my educational career, right? So I really just want to preface, this is just one perspective of a vast array of ways to look at the trans community and to learn about the trans community. So keep that in mind. Okay, a little bit about Youth Move National quickly. The MOVE stands for motivating others through voices of experience. One of the ways in which we do that is through our vision statement. Youth Move National envisions a future in which young people are valued as empowered leaders, advocates, and designers of communities that are built for all youth to thrive. Now, I place that emphasis on all because we really mean all youth to thrive, which means we actually have to look who is disproportionately affected by disparate health outcomes when we uh, examine systematic harm. Oftentimes, the folks most at the margins are then our BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, People of Color youth, and our 2S LGBTQI plus youth. We can also talk about our youth living with visible and invisible disabilities, right? And so that all is really meant to center those who are most pushed to the margins. And that's kind of what we're here to talk about tonight, right? We're gonna dive in to some of those communities such as the trans and non-binary communities. A prime example of this, and we'll talk through it without uh, this presentation this evening, um, is if you go on the ACLU webpage, we can see, and I checked this um, on Sunday, and I preface that because every time I give a number and I check it afterwards, it goes up, unfortunately. There was 474 anti-trans youth bills making its way through state legislators across the country. And I want y'all to keep in mind that, that if that wasn't horrible enough, those bills are actually passing in some states. And if that wasn't horrible enough, they're actually be then being enforced in some of those states as well. My tribal nation is down in Southern Texas, Northern Mexico. Um, and I know literal family members who are fleeing the state because they're being investigated for providing life-affirming, life-saving care to their trans and non-binary youth, right? So when we say all youth to thrive, we really mean it. And we're gonna talk all about ways that we can do that. So I also want to acknowledge and honor that the work we're doing here today is only possible thanks to the work of so many transgender and non-binary people who have come before us. 
one of the things I like to talk about and get out of the way right away is that being trans and non-binary is not a new thing. This is not a contemporary idea. It's not a phase that's hit with the kids. No, this has literally been around since the dawn of human civilization. A matter of fact, if we look at human history, we actually see gender diversity and gender expansiveness being the norm, the traditional norm globally throughout so many different native indigenous tribes across the world. It's not till actually we see uh, 14th century Western imperialism start to come in and the gender binary be introduced. And we'll talk very, very briefly about this. We do have limited amount of time, um, but we will talk about how that was invented as a tool of oppression, specifically around racial oppression. Um, so that's all to say, I just wanna honor our transcestors, pull them into the space with us, honor them for everything that they did and just say that they're here with us, guiding us now. Historically and globally, there are many, many, many different ways to talk about gender, right? Today, however, in order to narrow that field, we are gonna talk about gender expansiveness and gender diversity in sort of two main buckets. The first is a US context and an English speaking context, right? That's where I'm located. That's where most of y'all are located right? That's the knowledge base for today. So we will be talking specifically about U.S. and U.S. society, and I'll be using English as the language to talk about it because language is important, and we will be talking about language. The second bucket, though, is we are going to take an intersectional lens today. Now, intersectionality tends to be a buzzword that gets thrown around very often with sometimes very little consideration to what it actually means, because it does not just mean diversity, inclusion, equity. It does not. It actually means so much more. And I can't do it justice in this little bit of time, but I'm going to try slightly. So intersectionality is a term that was coined by the goddess, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw in 1988-89, and it comes out of a social justice movement called the River Kambahe Collective. And it was a group of Black feminists discussing their oppression as being Black, but also as being women and femmes, right? And really coming to the realization that those things happened simultaneously, right? They didn't experience oppression as just Black or as just women, right? Those things were happening layered on top of each other. And so the lens that we are going to take today is going to honor that complexity of experience, right? It's going to honor that even though we are going to talk about transphobia, cis sexism, and we'll talk about that word a little bit later on, we still have to honor greater anti-oppression work because it doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? It is complicated. Literally all of us are unique and our experiences are unique and all of those are happening simultaneously layered upon each other, right? So we've got to take that intersectional lens. In order to demonstrate that a little bit, if y'all can perceive your screen, what we have here is a wheel. We have a circle with a line splitting that circle down the middle. We'll call that the horizon line. Above the horizon line is a list of privileges in a US context. And then below the line is a list of oppressions or marginalizations, again, within a US context. Now, this chart isn't perfect. It is much more complicated than that. And even some of this language is a little bit problematic. But I am going to use myself, for example. And this is called social location mapping. So if you can perceive it, there's an arrow pointing below the horizon to transgender and gender diverse. That is where I fall. I am trans. I'm non-binary. I'm two-spirit. I'm also queer. I'm demi-pansexual also falls below the horizon. I'm reclaiming the term fat for myself. That falls below the horizon. I'm neurodivergent, falls below the horizon. I come from a low social economic background, falls below the horizon. And I'm also a person of color, right? I am BIPOC, I am Mexican indigenous. All of those are marginalizations and they all make up a complex person who then holds multiple marginalizations. However, 
for someone who's BIPOC, I'm very light-skinned. And in some geographic locations, because of colorism, I pass as white. That's a privilege. I'm English speaking as a first language. I'm a documented US citizen. I've been to graduate school. All of those things are privileges. So my point about all of this, what we're trying to get to here, is that all of those things are happening at once. All of those create a complex person, which is me, which means I'm also unique. And it means you're unique. And it means systems are unique. And it means all of the ways in which we then communicate together are unique and complex and complicated and sticky and messy, right? So today, you may actually be leaving with more questions than answers. And that's OK, because we're talking about people. And I want you to keep that in mind, because when we're talking about people, they are the only experts on themselves. If you want to know something about a person, only they can tell you, right? We're going to spend the vast majority of time on that first bucket. The second is understanding lived experiences. We'll watch a video. We'll talk a little bit about microaggressions and oppressions and the difference between interpersonal oppression and systemic oppression. And then lastly, we will wrap up today's session with some affirming actions. I always say that bucket one is about knowledge. Bucket two is how that plays out in the real world. And all of those things are fantastic to know. Education is important. Y'all are with me here now. I'm excited about that. But ultimately, that doesn't actually change anything. We actually have to do something with that knowledge, right? In order to shift the world to be more inclusive and affirming. And we'll actually talk about that term, affirming. It'll be the first thing that we'll do, right? So that last bucket is about those actions, those things you have to do in order to be an ally, right? In order to show up and make the world a more affirming place. So that is what our plan is for today. The first thing that I wanna do is to do that building affirming language. And like I said, I wanna talk about that term affirming, right? Language is important. Oftentimes we throw it around and we don't really do some level setting so that we all understand what we mean by those terms. So let's define it. By affirming, what we mean is to declare a belief that something is valid and true. It's to provide emotional support or encouragement. I'm gonna argue with that or in a moment. And three, it's the action and process of being affirming, which I always love when a word defines itself with itself. Um, but no matter, that is what affirming means. So today, and hopefully the point of today is to go beyond today, we are going to learn how to be trans affirming. So what do I mean by this? I mean, providing that a, believing that a person's gender identity is valid and true, because guess what? It is, it is no matter what. It is if you understand it 100%, it is if you understand it 0%. A person's gender identity is literally always valid and it's always true. Two, providing emotional support or encouragement. There's my argument. Those are two separate things. So an and would be great. I know I just said I could not speak on behalf of the whole of the queer and trans community, but I do feel safe that an and would be great there. And then lastly, it's the collective actions. Again, emphasis on actions, things you have to do and process of ensuring that a person's gender is always respected and honored, no matter what. Again, whether or not you even understand it, because I'm here to tell y'all, you don't actually need to understand in order to affirm. You don't need to understand in order to respect people. And you don't need to understand in order to know that a person's gender identity is valid and true, right? There's a lot that we take in that we don't understand, that we don't have that direct lived experience in, but we don't invalidate it and we don't gaslight it, right? Lots of different examples. I had uh, knee surgery done about six, seven years ago. I know nothing about knee surgery, nothing at all, but I trusted my doctor to have that knowledge. I'm Mexican indigenous. 
I literally have lived 0% of my life as a white person, as a black person, as an Asian person, etc. But I know that those folks are real, they exist, and their lived experiences are valid, right? So again, we have to change this notion that we're centering ourselves and our own understanding in order for us to affirm and validate folks, right? Gosh, it needs to be actually the opposite, right? We need to center the most marginalized and start to understand that we don't need to understand in order to affirm and respect people on basic human levels with basic human needs. And a person's gender identity is just that. It's a basic human need. It's a basic human level of respect. So no matter what, you get to the end of this training, you spend two hours with us today and you're like, I don't understand nothing beyond me probably not doing my job very well, that's okay. Because you don't actually need to understand in order to know that a person's gender identity is valid and true and needs to be respected and honored no matter what. Okay. With that being said though, yes, we do have content for you. We're gonna try to get you to understand a little bit for sure. And in order to do that, we are going to dive into the SIEO model. Now, the SIEO model, I want to name my citations, was developed by Dr. Eli Green, who was the founder of the Transgender Training Institute, and who wrote a lovely book called Teaching the Transgender Toolkit. So that is where we are getting this model from. So check it out to learn more, but I'll walk you through it. The S stands for sex assigned at birth. The I stands for gender identity. The E for gender expression. And then if you can perceive your screen, those are three triangles that are sort of intertangled. That's because those are the individual components of gender. Hiding out on the side, maybe in a little bit of a timeout for a while, is the O for sexual orientation. Now, one of the reasons why those triangles are separated is because those are separate things, right? The individual components of gender is just about that. It's about gender and gender expression and gender identity, right? Sexual orientation is actually about attractionality or lack thereof. It's about who we wanna be in relationships with, if anybody, right? That is different than those individual components of gender. So there's another big one that I hope that you'll take away from this and remember, that sexual orientation is different than the individual components of gender. Okay, so let's dive in deeper because we are gonna talk about every one of these letters. When I say sex, what do I mean? I mean a person's unique combination of genitals, sex chromosomes, hormones, secondary reproductive organs, and reproductive organs. I don't know if y'all know this, I'm about to blow some minds here, I think. There are at least 29, 29 at least different sexes. There is at least 29 different combinations of genitals, chromosomes, secondary sex traits, reproductive organs, and hormones. At least 29. Only, boop, two are what we think of as the traditional female and male, right? They're fitting neatly into these very rigid, socially constructed boxes of female and male. Only two of at least 29, right? So when we think about the gender binary, and we will define that in a moment. It makes zero sense because it literally does not exist. Even if we look at science and medicine, and biology, the gender binary literally does not exist. It doesn't exist in the animal kingdom. It does not exist in the human kingdom, right? There's at least 29 different combinations. So I want y'all to keep that in mind. Because what ends up happening, again, in the US context, is that we start to divide up folks, right? So now we're gonna divide up folks who are endosex, which describes sex traits that are categorized easily, traditionally as fitting into those rigid 
narrow, socially constructed boxes of female and male and everybody else, right? And that is the intersex community. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about the intersex community for probably about the next five or so minutes, but it's important to note that the intersex community is different than the trans and non-binary community. Although, of course, you can be intersex and also trans, right? And we'll talk about both of that. But to be intersex actually means this is describing the sex traits that are simply not easily categorized as either female or male. So what this ends up really doing is to start to divide and divide and divide to where we get this gender binary. And that's the classification of gender into two distinct immutable categories, man or woman. Now, this is probably the first real heavy part. So kind of, kind of prepare yourself. This is a direct product of colonization. A matter of fact, it's a direct product of Western imperialism dating all the way back to the 14th century. During the 14th century, there was this sort of like age of discovery, doctrine of discovery. And this was Christian uh, legal theory that said um, sort of Western European nations had the God-given right to all of the earth, land, resources, and people. And so that's where we see things like the Spanish Inquisition come out of that. One of the ways in which they used to justify this peripheration of Western imperialism is through the gender binary, was to actually say, you know what? White people are civilized. White people are progressive. White people are awesome and smart and 100% human. And everybody else is actually savage and is primitive and is uncivilized and is actually less than human, right? A prime example, if you bounce forward in history is the three-fifths rule, right, in the U.S. under settler colonialism, right? So the gender binary was actually invented as a tool to say, hey, white folks, we only have men and women. All these other global nations and tribes that are practicing gender diversity, nope, that's a prime example of how you are less than us. So it's actually created, again, to divide um, in order for really heavy terms, mass genocide to take place so that we can see the peripheration of uh, Western imperialism. So very deep. I know that that was a lot and we are going to keep moving, but I don't ever like to say anything without dropping some resources or some citations. So if you're interested in learning more, I've got three opportunities for you. The first and probably heaviest, maybe this is like a 401, is the documentary series on HBO Max, Exterminate All the Brutes. It's by Raul Peck. It's a really fantastic piece of media, and it gets really, really deep into what happened. I would say a middle ground resource would be Jonathan Van Ness from Queer Eye. If you don't know, JVN has a podcast, but also a Netflix show called Getting Curious. One of the episodes is actually dedicated to talking about the gender binary and where it comes from. So I would say, check that out. And then lastly, and we don't have information for you uh, currently, unfortunately, but I do do a webinar called Decolonizing the History of the Gender Binary. I just, which is weird to say, came off a speaker circuit where I did that at a few uh, conferences. Um, so if you see me around, if you want to reach out to Youth Move, hopefully we'll have some formal dates where you can catch a little bit about that as well. So that's the gender binary, and that is where it comes from. Now, that all leads us to sex assigned at birth. And sex assigned at birth is kind of the first time that we start to see these concepts, these theories, these uh, oppressions, start to jump off the page of history and to start to affect people on a day-to-day -day reality uh, and life. Because sex assigned at birth is really where we see the introduction of the gender binary really starting to create real harm. And that is, of course, our S and our SIEO model. So what is sex assigned at birth? 
That is the decision of which sex or gender marker is recorded on a birth certificate or another legal document if a person has one, right? So in a US context, I'm gonna give an example of a doctor. I know a ton of other folks do this, but for today, I'm just gonna use a doctor. When a child is born, what a doctor does at birth is they do a visual assessment of that child. And even though they're a doctor and they're brilliant, so please don't get me wrong, they ultimately make an educated guess. And all they do is check a box on a piece of paper. I'm positive it's not really a piece of paper, it's probably a tablet at this point or something or a computer, um, but that's what they're doing. They're doing a visual assessment alone, taking an educated guess of which sex or gender that baby is, and all they're doing is checking a box on a piece of paper. That is one sex assigned at birth. Now, we're here to talk all about trans and non-binary folk. We are going to do that. We are going to center them. But the concepts we're going to be talking about today appeal and involve vastly, almost the vast majority of all people, at least in the US context, right? So I would imagine if I said, raise your virtual hands if you have a birth certificate, the vast majority, if not probably all of you, would be raising your virtual hands, right? So it's really important to note as we talk about these things, there's often the tendency to push it away, to silo trans and non-binary people, right? Like sex assigned at birth, pronouns, affirming names. Oh, that's for trans people, not me. But in reality, it is, it is for you. The vast majority of us have an affirming name, right? Even Roberts sometimes like to be called Bob, right? The vast majority of us have pronouns we use. And even if we don't use pronouns, the vast majority of us will assume or use pronouns for other folks in which you should never do. We'll talk about that later. The vast majority of us have a sex assigned at birth, right? A birth certificate we can pull out. And when we get to the other letters of the SIO model, I'm gonna guess you have a relationship to those concepts as well. So what is sex assigned at birth? It's that checkbox. It's that M or that F standing for male or female on your birth certificate or another legal document. Now, one of the first problems we have with this is we've discussed there's at least 29 different combinations of sexes. So a, a visual assessment at birth, probably not the best way to figure it out. So unfortunately, what can sometimes happen is that at birth, if something seems off, to a doctor and something is not fitting neatly into those two rigid socially constructed boxes of male or female, gender corrective surgery will then take place. Sometimes this takes place even without the consent of the parents, but 100% of the time it takes place without the consent of the child, right? And so that's again where we're talking about the intersex community. And the thing that binds us together, the transgender community and the intersex community, and dare I say in a post, I hate to say this, Roe versus Way world, because that's where we live now, everybody is bodily autonomy because bodily autonomy is and should be a human right for everybody, right? So when we're talking about the intersex community, it's important to uplift this horrible practice that happens to spread awareness, and to give you some resources. So I know Journey being the amazing moderator that they are has probably already dropped it in the chat for you. Interact is a fantastic resource that I would encourage you all to go read more about. Their FQA page is fantastic. Um, so this is about trans and non-binary folk. So we're gonna kind of transition away from intersex and focus on that community. But before we do so and we keep moving, I just want to show a video that I happen to really, really love that talks a little bit more about what it's like to be intersex. So if you'll join me, let's take a break. Let's watch this video together. Raise your hands if you have testes. <laughs> I'm Pigeon, 
I'm Alice. I'm Emily. I'm Cypher. And, and we, we are, are Intersexy. Intersexy. Intersex describes a person who doesn't fit the typical definition of male or female. I have XY chromosomes, but typical female genitalia. I'm a girl who has testes and XY chromosomes. I identify as a queer, gender non-conforming intersex person. I identify as a black intersex man. Intersex is not new. It's been around since the beginning of human existence. I mean, there's probably even intersex dinosaurs, if you think about it. Transgender has to deal with your gender identity, whereas intersex has to deal with your biological characteristics. Often, intersex people get surgeries that they don't want, and transgender people have to fight for surgeries that they do want. They gave my mom the excuse that the internal testes were cancerous, that I would develop cancer. They didn't even come up with an excuse, basically, in terms of a health-related reason. They instead just said it was about the appearance. A lot of doctors are very uncomfortable with the idea that I have testes, and they're still trying to get them removed. But I'm perfectly healthy, and there's nothing wrong with them. They did a surgery to remove my testes and told my parents to take me home and just raise me as a girl. And I didn't find out about it myself until I was 12. There aren't a lot of options or medical providers don't explore other options. My mom would put me in dresses and she would be like, oh, aren't you so cute and you're so pretty? And I would be like, no, this is horrible. Ah. I was um, put on hormonal treatment, which consisted of estrogen and progesterone. I just wanted to belong. I wanted to fit in. I didn't want to be different. So even though I knew something felt amiss, I conformed. He was very condescending. He was like, you intersex activists don't know what you're talking about. It's difficult for intersex people to find each other because from an early age we're told not to talk about our bodies. I did feel like I was the only one. My doctors always told me there was nobody else like me. And so it just perpetuates a vicious cycle of shame and stigma that we can't break out of. I would tell another intersex person that you are worthy, you are lovable. Your body is beautiful, you're beautiful. Intersex people don't need to be fixed, there's nothing wrong with them. I know you feel like you might not be able to get through this. I know you might have really dark thoughts, but I want you to know that meeting other intersex people and finding a community or a support group can be one of the most important aspects in your healing process. And we're out there, we're out here. We're here, and I just hope you can find us. Okay, thank you so much for watching that video. We have several videos today. I really particularly really love that one. Uh, it's powerful, and I really hope that that helps tie some of the concepts that we've already talked about together and to talk a little bit more about the intersex community. Again, go check out Interact, a great FQA page. We now come to gender identity. Now. To talk about gender identity, it's helpful to do a quick recap. Sex assigned at birth, right? If we are defining that by a doctor doing a visual assessment at birth, taking an educated guess and checking a piece of paper, uh, either M for male or F for female, which is what is recorded onto that legal document, such as a birth certificate, if we have one, gender identity is actually the child. It's actually the kid, the youth who grows up, right? They grow up and they experience themselves and who they are, sometimes intrinsically, sometimes inherently in their heart, mind, body, spirit, and soul, right? So sex assigned at birth is a piece of paper. Gender identity is a person, is the person who's the expert on themselves and only gets to tell us who they are. That is gender identity. Again, it's the way in which really the vast majority of us, right, experience and know ourselves in our heart, mind, body, spirit, and soul, sometimes inherently, sometimes intrinsically, right? That is gender identity. Now, if you can perceive the screen, 
those triangles are back. And we have some examples of gender identity. We have man, we have woman, we have non-binary, and then we have a little thing that says, and more. Now, that is usually where I pause and say, hey, we do have a handout. We do have a glossary of some terms. But even if this training was 800 hours long, right, and all I did was a list of identities and definitions, right? It's like hour 797, I'm just like, a, a gender, a gender is with a person gender, right? Even if we're like doing that, we still would not get to all the different gender identities that exist because we're talking about people, right? And people are complex and people are unique right? So literally everybody has a different gender identity because there's nuances and there's subtleties even when you use the same name for it, right? I am trans and non-binary and I have so many trans and non-binary friends. I am blessed in my life to have them with me, right? And the ways in which even us, each other as friends, talk about our own identities as that same term is drastically and sometimes very small, but sometimes drastically different, right? So another reason why we are not going to go through a whole bunch of names and definitions for you is that I'd be wrong because I can only speak on behalf of myself, right? If you want to know how someone else identifies with some other terminology, go on to blogs, go on to YouTubes, read some good resources, and most importantly, talk to the people in your life and find out more about who they are because only they are the experts on themselves, not me. I cannot define who they are for you. So I hope that makes sense. But to bring it back, sex aside at birth is the piece of paper, right? It's that check mark on a legal document such as a birth certificate. Gender identity is the person, right? That's that person who grows up and they experience themselves like we all do in our heart, mind, body, spirit, and soul and get to tell the world who we are. The next slide, and some of you may be processing this already, is going to start to look at the complications of when those two concepts come together. Because that is actually where we get these terms cisgender and transgender from. Both of these buzzwords, highly politicized, thrown around a whole lot, and both of which are complicated because people are complicated. But as far as a concept goes, I think they're relatively simple and easy to understand. Someone who is cisgender is when that sex is signed at birth, that check mark on a piece of paper, aligns with that person's gender identity, right? Those two things match, those two things align. So for example, let's say someone took out their birth certificate as we all do, and they looked at it and they saw an M for male. And they say, okay, cool doctor, I see you. That's my sex assigned at birth. Well, let me think about it for a moment. Yeah, yeah, you know what? I'm a man. That's how I know myself as the expert of myself. It's how I intrinsically and inherently experience myself and my heart, mind, body, spirit, and soul. I'm a man. So those two things align. Those two things overlap. That would be someone who would be cisgender. Transgender, it's just when they don't. It's just when those do, th two things don't align, right? It's complicated because it's people. But it's really just as simple as that, right? So for me, I took out my birth certificate, I looked at it, I looked at it again, I looked at it maybe three or four times, I was doing those like animated Looney Tunes double take, like, Whoa! right? Like, I was like, no, whoa, pump the brakes there, doctor. You got great knowledge, you did lots of education and research, right? But you took an educated guess and you actually got it wrong. That's not at all how I experience myself intrinsically, inherently, and my heart, mind, body, spirit, and soul, right? Those two things don't align. That would be the transgender community. 
I hope that makes sense. Because now I want to pull in that term non-binary. So again, transgender is describing a person whose gender identity does not match the sex they were assigned at birth. Because of that definition, it's really broad, right? So a lot of different people, a lot of different lived experiences, a lot of different identities and communities can fall under that word. So transgender is what we would consider to be an umbrella term. Non-binary can sometimes fall underneath that transgender umbrella. Now I say sometimes because it doesn't always. Again, people are complex, people are nuanced, and there's some non-binary folk who actually do not identify as trans. And that's okay, right? Our point is to celebrate them for who they are and not need to understand every nuance because we don't need to understand it all in, un in order to affirm people, right? But if we look at how we're sort of defining it for y'all today, we can see some subtle nuance. So non-binary for the purposes of this evening's training describes a person whose gender identity does not easily, there's the nuance, does not easily fit into those rigid, socially constructed boxes of boy, man, or girl, woman, right? So because of that, we actually see a complicated area where transgender is an umbrella term in which sometimes non-binary falls underneath, but we also see non-binary as its own umbrella term where other identities fall underneath, right? What's the important takeaway is to just know the basic understanding of it and to just to talk to folks in your life, right? They are the only experts on themselves and they can let you know if it's right, if you've built that relationship, if it makes sense for the conversation, how they identify and the nuances of that, right? No one is running up to you on the street going like, oh my God, you're cisgender? Whoa, honey, honey, look, we got a cisgender over here. Oh my God, look at you. Is there real life? Oh, you're real, cisgender person. So let me, let me walk you through this. Your sex is signed at birth, your birth certificate matches your gender identity? Whoa, that's weird. That's weird. Tell me more. Tell me more. It's silly. We don't do that. But unfortunately, for some reason, we do do that to trans and non-binary people. Why? I don't know. Doesn't, doesn't like understand uh, my mind at all. But sometimes we do. So we have to keep in mind that subtlety that we want to learn, sure, but not at the expense of someone's privacy and someone's personal confidential, in, confidential information, especially because we don't actually need to know to affirm and respect that person, right? Okay, hope that makes sense. We'll keep it moving. One out of 10 LGBTQ people in the US identify as non-binary and B, being a youth advocate, wanna bring that youth in. One out of four LGBTQ youth in the US identify as non-binary, right? So one out of 10 broad, and then one out of four youth. Now we say this for kind of two reasons. One, to show we've always been here and we're here in pretty big numbers, right? But two, it's also to demonstrate that it actually doesn't matter if it was like one out of 7 billion, right? It doesn't matter if it's just like Timothy in Alberta, Canada, hanging out, being the one non-binary person on the face of the planet, right? Doesn't matter. We'd be like, cool, Timothy, you're non-binary. That is valid and true and needs to be respected and honored, no matter what, no matter if I understand it or not, no matter if you're literally the only person who identifies that way or not, still valid and true. But in reality, we're here in pretty big numbers, right? And we're starting to see that grow because folks are actually starting to pay attention and to collect that information. Data is very important. So to talk a little bit about the youth experience, I wanna queue up a video about Pinnell, which I love so much. So we are going to watch a video about Pinnell. We won't watch the full thing. I'm gonna stop it probably about four minutes in. 
But once we stop it, we're going to come to our sort of first official participation session. I'm going to open the chat and I'm going to ask you a question that actually Pinell's bomb will name in the video. So if you're paying attention, you may actually see a preview of the question I'm about to ask you. So let's go ahead and watch this together. Jody Patterson. I'm a mom of five. Uh, we live in Brooklyn. We just moved to Bed-Stuy. We're just like a regular family. We are always at a crossroad, like can we afford tuition? Like do we eat green food or do we eat like fast food? What's cheaper? So this is Othello. This is my rascal. This is Cassius, my oldest. I like to call him the president. That's Penelope. And that's the That's Penelope, who's seven. Eight. Nell is my third child, and we assumed girl, like perfectly anatomically perfect girl. Everything looked in order. Really early on, there were signs that Penel was very different. Something was weighing on Penelope really, really heavy. Every time we would try to put him, put clothing on him or dress him or bathe him, there was like an intense reaction to his body from himself. Once Penelope started to speak, it was like, I'm not a baby. It was one of the first like sentences, I'm not baby, and no. It was like no to clothing, no to shoes, no to hair brushing. And so one day I remember pulling Penelope aside and just being like, you know, like what, what's really wrong, baby? Like, why are you so upset? And Penelope said, well, because everyone thinks I'm a girl. Oh, wait. And so I said, oh, baby, it's fine. You can, yeah. however you feel on the inside is great. And he said, no, I don't feel like a boy, Mama. I am a boy. And so like that sentence was really hard because you don't, I was like ill-equipped. Like, OK, what do I do with that? I don't know how to handle that. I felt like I had kind of maybe dropped the ball in some area. All of my sisters and my mom you know, raised me to really be proud of being a woman. And my child was like, I'm not, I don't want to be a woman. Like, I'm not a woman, I don't want to be a woman. I love you, mama, but I don't want to look like you. I want to look like dad. So I just felt like, what had I done? Had I forgotten to do something that was really essential to self-pride? That's my sister. That's me when I was three or two, when I was shy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's me. That's Cap. that's Penelope. A lot of people confuse this conversation that I had with Penelope as being something too advanced for like a two-year-old to talk about, but identity is something that happens that early. I think when people like say, well, how does Penelope know that he's a boy at age two? And I would say, well, when did you realize you were a woman? It was like crystal clear what he was saying. I don't want to be you, mama. I want to be papa. I want a doctor to make me a peanut. <laughs> I don't want boobs. I do remember at that moment, in my head not considering Penelope she anymore. I was really aware that what Penelope was talking about was identity. But in terms of me, why did I let my kid sort of lead in this moment? You know, because it, it smacked me in the face. Guys, watch this. Close your eyes. This is going to be fingers yeah. with blood. She don't say it. Fingers yeah. with blood. Oh, you do Lots but exactly, it's actual blood for the Oh, Bob, Bob, don't do that. Don't use actual blood. Ketchup. Fingers. <laughs> nope, not ketchup. I don't like ketchup stuff. Fing Except. Fingers with blood. Chicken. <laughs> 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 what? <laughs> like, after we just said, okay, yes, you're a boy, and it's all good, and, and like, yes, yeah. you can wear it really like boy clothing, not like tomboy clothing, but like, just go to the boy section, like find anything that you want to wear and wear it. You know, he just kind of lit up. Initially, it's like weird. You notice like all the constructs around gender. And in the same way, you become very keen on the way you treat girls and the way you treat boys. I like the fact that the kids sometimes talk about it and debate it or don't see eye to eye. And if Penelope can handle that conversation in our house, then he's ready for handling it in the world. His siblings and his friends 
protect him. So like, if we're walking into a new situation, a lot of times his best friends will step ahead and be like, okay, so my friend Penelope's coming. He is a boy, he likes to be seen as a boy. You can call him Penel, you can call him Penelope, you can call him Jack, <laughs> but he's gonna come in and he's a boy. <laughs> So there's like this kind of like camaraderie that his siblings have with him and his friends have that, you know, they kind of look out for him. We play challenges. I want to ask you literally that question that Pennell's mom asked, right? Which is at what age or stage of life did you become aware of your gender identity, right? It was so clear, right? It was like, no, mama, I don't want to be a boy, I am a boy. At age two, Pinnell knew, right? And then when folks questioned Pinnell's mom, she was like, well, when did you know, right? So again, having that emphasis that even though we're talking about trans and non-binary communities, all of us, the vast majority of us have a sex assigned at birth, a gender identity, right? We have affirming names. We have affirming pronouns. We have ways in which we express ourselves, right? So there's actually no one age or stage that people become aware of their gender identity. There's some patterns, right? So let's talk about those patterns. As early as two to three, as soon as folks can start to develop that language, those ways to express themselves, we hear gender identity coming out immediately, right? as in cases the Pinnell, as in case with some of you all in the chat. We also see four to five being common as well because some folks were named in kindergarten. Precisely right. Now we have the introduction of sort of outside systems, outside peers, right? Introduction to the K through 12. So we're starting to get those societal influences now, right? So that starts to pivot and change the ways in which we view ourselves. Eight to 12, plus puberty range, not gonna talk about it. Horrible time for me, we'll keep moving, but should be very clear like why that would be another time that this could happen. But then we're seeing 17, 17 plus, right? Now we see this for a lot of different reasons. Folks are growing up, folks are starting to develop more of a sense of self, more of a sense of autonomy, right? They're sort of free, they can do things on their own, right? But we also start to see this come out because not everybody, so don't get me wrong, some folks have awesome, loving, affirming families, homes, and systems. But disproportionately, disproportionately, we see the trans and non-binary community not having affirming homes, affirming schools, affirming systems. And that leads to disproportional rates of substance misuse, houselessness, food insecurity, suicidal ideation, abuse and childhood trauma, right? Disproportionate rates of this. So it's all to say, it's not even safe sometimes to be yourself while you're still in the home. Sometimes folks have to wait till they can find their people, they can find their community, they can find that safety. And I'm here to tell you, not everyone does, right? Because we don't live in a society, unfortunately, that does that trans-affirming care, that believes everybody to be experts on themselves, that says, yes, no matter what you say, you are valid and true, and you need to be respected and honored. Those 474 anti-trans youth bills is a prime example of just that, right? So we see this all across the board, okay. Which leads me now to the E and our SIEO model, which is gender expression, right? So sex assigned at birth is the piece of paper, right? That check mark. Gender identity is the person who gets to tell us who are experts on themselves, how they experience themselves intrinsically, inherently in their heart, mind, body, spirit, and soul. And then gender expression is actually the ways in which we express that, right? It's that outward expression of who we are. At the best of times, at the best of times, it's the ways in which we tell the world, hello, I am here, this is who I am, I'm beautiful, I'm lovely, celebrate me. 
at the worst of times, it's the opposite. It's actually not outward, it's inward. It's societal gender norms. It's societal pressures. It's society saying, you know, boys like pink or blue and girls like pink and girls play with dowels and boys play with bricks and do construction thing, whatever boys and men do, I don't know. They get dirty and do things, er, um, right? That's society. So we've got to think about that because when we're talking about gender expression, yes, it's how a person communicates their gender to the world, but it's also how the world communicates gender to us. And so because of that, we see it's mostly visible, but not always. It can be drastic, but it can be subtle. It can change over the course of time. Of course, we all do. And gender expression is not always an indicator of gender identity. Now, there's some big, some big points here where I paused us and say, we've got to remember this, right? First, you don't need to understand in order to affirm. Second, the individual components of gender is separate than sexual orientation. And this is another big one here. Gender expression is not always an indicator of gender identity. A matter of fact, even though all of these concepts, sure, are interrelated, are interconnected, they're all separate things. Someone's pronouns are just that. It's just their pronouns. It's not always related. Someone's gender identity. It's just what feels good to them. Someone's gender identity is just that. It's their gender identity. It's not always connected to gender expression, right? Our names, right, isn't necessarily connected to gender expression or gender identity or even our pronouns. All of these things can be separate on their own. So the best way to remember this is to not make assumptions. If you don't walk up to someone and be like, hey, Susan, what's up? And they're like, my name's Robert. Nah, you look like a Susan. You're Susan to me, Susan, right? None of us would do that that silly because we don't assume someone's name. But I'm here to tell you, if we don't assume names, we don't assume pronouns. And if we don't know, assume pronouns, we don't assume gender identity based upon gender expression. So steadfast rule, just don't assume, ask, and you'll be all good, right? The best way to find out someone's name, pronoun, gender identity is to simply ask. I wouldn't ask about gender identity, that's personal, but names and pronouns, feel free. So I hope that makes sense. I'm also very aware that I'm very shiny. I do all my meetings outside the sun. It's just like gleaming in right now, but I feel so warm, so it's nice. So the gender shows up almost everywhere. Of course, it can be the clothes you wear, but it can also be your name. It can also be the tone of your voice. It can be the sports you play, the colors you like, the products you buy, right? Gender is everywhere. And so we have to keep in mind where that is coming from because it's coming from stereotypes, right? That's all gender is. A gender norm is a stereotype, right? And so because of the very definition of stereotypes, right? It means it's not true. The very definition of a stereotype is mean it's based up on nothing not based upon fact, it's a myth, right? So when we're talking about gender expression, because of stereotypes, we kind of have to hold two things to be simultaneously true. One is that gender expression, really specifically gender norms, society and world telling us what gender is and how it should look, can cause so much harm and violence so much, right? Anyone can play softball. Anyone can like the color pink, right? These are stereotypes. And because of that, it can cause so much harm. However, this is the world we live in. And I love being me. I love being trans and non-binary. I love pairing a skirt with facial hair. I love having tattoos and my nails done, right? I love it. So we also have to hold simultaneously to be true that these are ways in which we can celebrate people. Because at the best of times, these are people saying, 
I love me and this is who I am. I'm beautiful. And we need to celebrate that while also recognizing that gender norms can cause a lot of harm and violence. And the difference is to not make assumptions and to celebrate people no matter what they look like, right? Because what fits for one person is perfect for them. You don't have to do that. You get to do whatever you want to do for yourself. And all of those things, that huge spectrum should be celebrated, right? I am not here to actually get rid of gender. I don't want us to all wear white robes and all be the cult of Susan, right? Like we are Susan, we are she, her, her pronouns. No, it's actually quite the opposite. I want to celebrate gender and gender expression, right? Not cause harm and violence because of it. So I want us to keep that in mind when we're talking about gender expression. Because gender expression can be conforming, gender expression can also be non-conforming, right? And oftentimes when we're talking about gender expression being non-conforming, we're centering and siloing trans and non-binary folk. But, and I hope you know this because I've been saying it over and over again, the vast majority of us have a relationship to these things, right? If anyone can like the color pink, you too can be gender non-conforming, right? Because we do actually see this play out with the cisgender community. I literally have a friend who is a cisgender male. So born, doctor did a visual assessment at birth, checked M on the box of their birth certificate. That's their sex assigned at birth. They grew up, they experienced themselves in their heart, mind, body, spirit, and soul. It was like, yeah, I'm a man. Looked at their birth certificate and said, cool, I'm cisgender, because those two things match and they align. But you know what? When it's sunny out, when it's hot and humid, dresses are awesome. Are you kidding me? They feel good on your skin. They let the air in. They feel so good. I love dresses, right? Anyone can dress any way, right? So when we go to just silo these concepts to just trans and non-binary folk, I want us to think about that. Anyone can be gender non-conforming because we should celebrate folks for who they are, no matter what that looks like. Okay, I hope that makes sense because that's kind of the end. That's the end of our first bucket. That's the SIEO model. We talked about sex assigned at birth, gender identity, gender expression. Those are the individual components of gender. Sexual orientation is separate. That is just simply about attractionality or lack of. It's who you want to be in relationships with anyone. It's different. We didn't talk about that at all in the past hour, right? So we have to keep in mind, those are separate identities. And to wrap up everything, we just say, Keep in mind, you don't have to fully understand someone's identity in order to respect and affirm them, right? Okay, so that leads us to the end of our first bucket. We're going to go into our second bucket. There's a lot of age-appropriate books out there that I particularly love. I don't know if you all know about this organization called Lambda Legal. Amazing, amazing organization. They actually have an offshoot that's called Lamba Literary, and they do these awards every year, but they basically track 2S LGBTQI books and sort of like literary published authors and materials. They have an awesome website, check them out, and you can actually filter by age groups. So I'd say that's the best resource for the time period, so check that out. I hope that that answers your question. What's the difference between pangender and non-binary? There's a lot, but I'm not going to get into definitions today. Again, we'd be here all day if I did that, right? So I'd say go read some blogs, watch some videos. And if you know someone who's pangender, maybe ask them, right? Develop a relationship because the way in which I might define that now, well, I guarantee you at least be slightly different from anyone else you probably meet. And then lastly, what if you fall above and below the horizon line? Okay, I'm assuming we're going all the way back to the beginning and talking about intersectionality. Then guess what? You have privileged identities and marginalized identities, just like I do, right? 
because people are complicated. So what happens, you gotta be cognizant of your privilege in some spaces, and then you also have to be cognizant of your marginalization in others. Okay, we're gonna watch this video, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about oppressions and microaggressions, or what I like to call exclusionary actions. So let's watch this video together. Hey, Greg, thanks for getting me the data on client retention. It was super helpful. No problem. Happy to help. That's me, Jennifer, the superhero. Sorry, my bad. No problem. I'm glad you got what you needed. Hey, do you have all the data from the Mid-Atlantic region? I do. Greg got it to me this morning. Uh, you, you mean Jennifer? <laughs> I do. <laughs> I just can't get used to it. Well, try a little harder. It matters. I know. I knew Jennifer is Greg for five years, so give me a few weeks to get used to this change. Work on it. Jennifer and Mandy, can you share the data you gave me with Mandy? It'll be helpful for the marketing project she's working on. Mandy, Jennifer can get you whatever you need. He's a miracle worker. He's a miracle worker, even when he compliments me. I swear, I'm trying. I just have a mental block or something. Well, nobody else has one. It was one thing when Jennifer transitioned. Everyone screwed up. I did. But it's been months. I know, but it was her choice, not mine. Cut me some slack. We did. She did. But that was then and this is now. I'll try, but you know what? I'm not going to lose sleep over what pronoun I use. Nice. Try thinking about what it would feel like to be different and wanting to be comfortable and included. All right, I'm not a bad guy. I'll make the effort. Okay, thank you for that video. It's horrible because it's about workplace microaggressions. And in reality, most workplaces, unfortunately, is way worse than that. Uh, but it's just that dude at the end. All right, guess I'll make the effort. Like, come on, dude. Oh my gosh. Anyways, so. That is a prime example of what takes place in a lot of workplaces, and that's a lived experience for trans and non-binary folks. And what we're really talking about here is microaggressions or exclusionary actions, right? Now, I make that qualifier because really they're not always micro, right? They're not always small. Because when we look at it, we kind of see this form of oppression falling into two categories, interpersonal, which tends to mean like one-on-one, -on -one, person to person. And from there, we can see microaggressions actually being verbal attacks, physical assault, right? Not just misgendering. And we'll talk about that in our next section. But it's also important to know that this happens systemically as well, right? Sometimes I do this training and folks are like, oh, thank you, this is helpful, Tay. I don't really need it though. I'm just gonna be kind. I'm just gonna be nice and kind to everybody and then I will be all right. The golden rule, right? I'll just treat everyone the way I wanna be treated. To that, I say two things. One, the golden rule is actually the opposite of centering kindness and respect. It's literally centering you, right? It's the way you wanna be treated. So I like to propose the platinum rule for folks, treat others the way they want to be treated. And then I would also say, yes, please be kind to people, but systemic violence, systemic oppression is real, right? No amount of individual kindness is going to solve 474 anti-trans youth bills. It's not gonna solve Texas legislation, Florida legislation. It's not gonna change systemic barriers that are real, that exist. For example, I'm in the state of Michigan, and it actually hasn't fully made its way down through the courts yet. So it's still, technically this could happen today. It really only changed about three weeks ago, but I could be applying for an apartment and someone could be so nice. Oh my gosh, Tay, I love you so much. Look at your nails. They're so beautiful. I love that color pink. I am just all about you. Oh my gosh, love and appreciate you so much. Cool, so did I get the apartment? No, absolutely not, silly. You're trans and legally in the state of Michigan, I can actually deny you housing. I can actually say, Tay, you're not getting this because you're trans. And that's perfectly legal. Oh my gosh, you have a great day now though. 
right? So yes, please be kind, but please be aware that systemic violence is real. And there's a lot of different ways that we show this popping up in the workplace, right? It can be hiring discrimination, which is systemic. It could be getting misgendered, which is interpersonal. It could be lack of safe and private bathroom access, systemic, right? So this all, if we're bringing intersectionality, these microaggressions, these exclusionary actions actually happen simultaneously. And if we're once again bringing in intersectionality, layered on top of this is racism, classism, ableism, sexism, the like, right? So microaggressions are real, systemic violence is real, oppression is real, and unfortunately the trans and non-binary community face a lot of this day to day, right? That's the very real lived experience of a lot, a lot of us. Okay, shortest bucket out of all of them, right? I promised you we're gonna get to all of the content. The first bucket was the biggest one. We just wanted to dip our toe into the water of talking a little bit about microaggressions and oppressions, right? Please, there is so much more resources. You can go learn more, but just wanted to talk a little bit about the knowledge and then how that plays out in the real world. In order for us to get to actually my favorite bucket, the last and final bucket, where we're gonna synthesize all that knowledge and actually give you hopefully some helpful tips and tricks so that you can go out into the world and make it more affirming, right? To do those actions. Again, ally is about actions. It's about things that you've got to do. And that'll be the first thing that we do is actually define what ally means, right? Because I like to define my terms. So let's get into affirming actions. And in order to do that, I want to bring in the brilliant and awesome mind of Mia McKenzie. Now, if you don't know Mia McKenzie, check her out. She's got a new book out. She does a blog called Black Girl Dangerously and is brilliant. Mia defines ally as such. Ally, love those air quotes, ally cannot be a label that someone stamps onto you or God forbid you stamp onto yourself so you can go around claiming it as some kind of identity. It's not an identity. It's not an identity. It's a practice. It is an active thing that must be done over and over again in the largest and smallest ways every day, right? Love that definition of an ally. It's actions. You actually have to be doing things, right? Again, I oftentimes get folks like, okay, cool, I get it, Tay. I'm going to be more accepting. Cool. What does that mean? To be more accepting, you actually have to do something. What is the action that you're going to do, right? That's just a cutesy platitude. What are the things you're gonna do, right? You are here in this training. You are doing an action right now that hopefully will make the world a more affirming place. You're using someone's affirming name and affirming pronouns. That's hopefully gonna make the world a better place. You turn off your computer, I go inside my house and watch Great British Bake Off. I'm not being an ally. I'm not doing the actions. Although I probably will do that after this, but that's okay. We all got to do our thing, right? So keep in mind, ally is about actions. And to talk about some of those actions, we're going to watch another video. I love this video so much. And we're going to get five tips for being an ally. And then we're going to wrap it up. And I'm going to give you three and I'm gonna let y'all go about your day. So let's watch this video. Hey friends. So I'm trying something different with my setup and I don't know if it's working, but you will deal. <laughs> Imagine your friend is building a house and they ask you to help, but you've never built a house before. So it'd probably be a good idea for you to put on some protective gear and listen to the person in charge. Otherwise, someone's gonna get seriously hurt. Look, I'm helping. It's the exact same idea when it comes to being an ally. An ally is a person that wants to fight for the equality of a marginalized group that they're not a part of. We need your help building this house, but you probably should listen so you know what to do first. Let's do this. So here are my five tips 
for being a good ally. Understand your privilege. Now a lot of people get hung up on the word privilege, so let me break it down for you nice and easy. Privilege does not mean that you are rich, that you've had an easy life, that everything's been handed to you and you've never had to struggle or work hard. All it means is that there are some things in life that you will not experience or ever have to think about just because of who you are. It's kind of like those horses that have those blinders on. They can see just fine. There's just a whole bunch of stuff on the side that they don't even know exists. So for example, there are currently 29 states where you can legally be fired for being gay. And there are 34 states where you can legally be fired for being trans. Now as a straight cis woman, those are things that I don't have to ever think about if I don't want to. I'm not gonna be fired because I'm straight and I'm not gonna be fired because I am cis. So it makes sense that before I can fight for the rights of others, I have to understand what rights I have and others don't. That's privilege. Listen and do your homework. It sounds like a no-brainer, but it's not possible for you to learn if you aren't willing to listen. So you gotta know when to zip up the lip up. I don't know. You get what I mean. But that's the thing that's so cool about social media. There are so many people sharing their stories all around the world and connecting with people that they normally would never get a chance to without the power of the internet. So do your homework. Start reading blogs, tweets, news articles, and stories so that you can get caught up on the issues that are important to the communities that you want to support. Speak up but not over. If the fight for equality was a girl group, the ally wouldn't be the lead singer or the second lead singer. They'd be Michelle. An ally's job is to support. You want to make sure that you use your privilege and your voice to educate others, but make sure to do it in such a way that does not speak over the community members that you're trying to support or take credit for things that they are already saying. This isn't Mario Kart. Stay in your lane. Realize that you're going to make mistakes and apologize when you do. Nobody's perfect. Unlearning problematic things takes time and work, so you are bound to mess up and trip and fall. No oh god. But don't worry, you can brush yourself off and get right back up. I'm back up! Just remember that it's not about your intent, it's about your impact. So when you get called out, make sure to listen, apologize, commit to changing your behavior, and move forward. Last but certainly not least, Actually, the most important thing on this list is remember that ally is a verb. Saying you're an ally is not enough. You gotta do the work. One through four. One through four. As always, there are links in the- The comment about Michelle gets me every time. It's so mean. It's so mean, but it's so, it's so funny. So rest of the video is just like and subscribe. Um, fantastic. I hope you like those five tips because we are now hey, gonna go into three of them. And the first one I have for you is to do everything you possibly can to avoid misgendering. And in order to define what misgendering is and how not to do it, we've got to talk about pronouns, right? We've been saying it, we've been talking about it, let's talk about pronouns. This is another hugely politicized buzzwords that gets blown out of proportion, and it's actually really just like a simple concept. Pronouns are literally just third-person honorifics that stand in place in so of someone's name to refer to a specific person in a sentence, right? So you could say, hey, they, pronoun, did a fantastic training and you learned a whole lot, right? That's pronouns. Now, and I saw it in the chat, which is like perfect timing. Pronouns are mandatory. So if you have anything, that says uh, optional pronouns, uh, preferred pronouns, uh, uh, preference around pronouns, um, anything that indicates that pronouns are anything other than mandatory, we need to update some language, right? Let's say your name is Robert and your pronouns are he, him, his. And suddenly I am like, hey, Susan, how you doing? Hey, everyone, check out Susan. Oh, gosh, she's real cool. Yeah, she's real cool. What's up, Susan? One, you'd be confused. And two, the prolonged use of that would start to really hurt. Because you'd be like, my name's not Susan, and my pronouns are not she, her, her. Right? It's the same thing. Right? Again, we isolate trans and non-binary folk. But in reality, the vast majority of us have a name, and we have pronouns, even if we choose not to use pronouns, right? 
So pronouns are those third person honorifics that stand in person of someone's name in a sentence, and they are not a preference. They are not optional. They are mandatory. I always say my mandatory pronouns are. Now I do that because I'm a trans educator. I find that that opens the door to a conversation. For y'all, I would recommend just saying my pronouns are, or asking for affirming pronouns. So those are pronouns. Now, there is a lot of different pronouns, right? We talked about, I'm seeing the question again about like pan gender, right? Just like there is so many different gender identities, there is so many different pronouns. Think about names. There's so many different names, right? For people, just like there are so many different pronouns. And again, I could explain every one. We could make this training 7,000 hours long. But ultimately, what this is about is honoring the language people use for themselves. So if someone says, my name is Susan, I'm pangender, and my pronouns are they, them, there. Guess what? Susan is pangender, and they, them, there are the pronouns that you need to use for them, right? Oftentimes, I find the complication with pronouns isn't the concept, it's the execution, right? It's getting used to asking them, it's getting used to using pronouns that we're not used to, and it's getting used to not assuming pronouns, right? Because there's a lot of different things. But the good news is all of those three things I just named, you can practice, right? That's actions that you can do, right? That's how you be affirming. That's how you be an ally is by doing those actions. And we'll talk about some of those tips and tricks in a moment. Also want to mention while we're talking about pronouns, multi-use or no-use pronouns, right? There's a lot of different ways that folks can use pronouns in combination with each other or separately. And surprise, surprise, a lot of different reasons why people do this, right? Certain pronouns feel better in certain spaces. Navigating expressing parts of ourselves can be overwhelming. And some folks feel like one set doesn't always express fully who they are. So what can you do? This is what we're about, tips and tricks, those affirming actions. Ask. It's okay to ask. I know a lot of people feel uncomfortable about this, but the vast majority of us have affirming names and affirming pronouns, and we actually don't know what neither one of those is unless someone tells us. So the main thing you can do is introduce yourself with your name and pronouns, and not just in spaces where you think trans and non-binary people are. Please do not do this. Model this everywhere you go, because the vast majority of us have, whether we're cisgender or not, name and pronoun, right? So all you have to do is model that language, introduce yourself, and if that fails, just ask. It's okay to ask. You're giving someone the option, right? And then practice. You have to actually practice these things, and we'll talk about this in a moment, and then check in with periodically, right? Because they can update. It can change and shift, just like we talked about with gender expression, which leads us to misgendering. We have to understand pronouns and affirming names in order to understand misgendering. Because essentially, what misgendering is, is when we get those names and pronouns wrong, right? It's using a name, pronoun, honorifics, or other gendered language that does not match or affirm a person's gender identity. So. How can you avoid this? I've got a great tool for your ally toolkit. It's called Interrupt Correct Bottle. Interrupt Correct Bottle. If you can perceive your screen, we have these sort of two cartoon characters. One is going to misgender a person who is not here, Javi. Now, Javi uses they, them, their pronouns. One of these cartoon characters is going to misgender Javi. Now, another one, though, is actually going to do this tool. They're going to interrupt, they're going to correct and model, just like folks were doing in that Workplace Jennifer video, right? That is misgendering, but that is also ways in which you can do this interrupt, correct model, right? So one person says, oh my gosh, Javi just came by to say hello. 
gosh, he's always so nice. Oop, that's a misgender, that's a mistake. So now here's the other person, interrupt correct model. Oh, Javi's pronouns actually, interruption, are they them there, correction, but you're right, they are a really sweet person. That's the model, right? It doesn't need to be a huge explosion. It doesn't need to be a fight, a huge call out. It can just be a really casual thing, right? Just interrupt that pattern, correct it, and model it. Oh, actually, Javi's pronouns are interruption. They, them, there. Correction, but you're right. They are a really sweet person. And that's the modeling. And that's oftentimes I do when I get misgendered. Someone may say like, oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, she's going to do a great presentation for you. And I say, oh, gosh, thank you so much for introducing me. You're right. I am going to do a good presentation. They are going to be fantastic for you today. Right. I just kind of model that language back to be like, oop, let me correct that for you. So, again, do everything you can to avoid misgendering. But when you do, because you will, we all make mistakes, own it, and try these different tools. Now, there's a few ways that this can come up. We can use a person's prior name or wrong pronouns. We can use an incorrect salutation or honorific. And we can refute to a, a, a group of people using binary language. And you're all going to be so mad at me when we talk about this one. But we're going to get into all three very briefly. So the first one, how can you avoid that? Just model it and just ask. That's all you've got to do. Hello, my name is and my pronouns are, right? And then you can even follow up, hey, what name and pronouns would feel best or most firming for me to use for you, right? That's all you gotta do. Now, if it goes well, you're starting to build a rapport, I would suggest some follow-up conversations because as we talked about, that harm and violence in day-to-day -day lives of trans and non-binary folk is very real. And so we wanna assure safety. We want to ensure we're doing that work as an ally. So ask, hey, if I run into you in the conference room or we're in a Zoom meeting at work, is that still the name and pronouns you want me to use? If I see you at the grocery store, is that still the name and pronouns I should use? Hey, your family comes to visit. Is that still the name and pronouns that I should use? Have that conversation around safety. Honorifics. Who golly. Oftentimes, I find honorifics are an outdated uh, little way to be respectful. But if you insist on doing it, there is actually a gender neutral honorific. It's spelled MX and it's pronounced mix, like I'm mixing a bowl, right? Same thing as the last one, though. All you have to do is ask. Again, if we're not doing the golden rule, if we're doing the platinum rule, they need to identify that for you to truly be kind and respectful, right? All the time people are like, ah, I just use sir and ma'am because it's what's right. I'm just trying to be nice and respectful. Cool, I want you to be nice and respectful. But in order to do that, you actually have to find out what is nice and respectful to that person. And the only way you can do that is to ask. And if you don't know, and there's no easy way of finding out, I use they, them, their pronouns as my go-to until I learn otherwise. So I'm modeling and practicing that gender inclusive language. And then lastly, oh my gosh, y'all, you guys is gendered language. I'm sorry, I know you're all gonna be mad at me and I get it. I get that so many people say, hey, everyone uses it. We've kind of moved past it. Everyone knows that we don't literally mean guys. But here's the thing socialization matters. Gender norms matter. And interrupting those patterns is really important. So if you can start using y'all, you all, gosh, that's a great action. It's a great little thing that you can do every day to try to do those powerful actions to create that more trans-affirming world, right? Instead of ladies and gentlemen, you can say everyone, esteemed colleagues, et cetera. And again, I'm not here to get rid of gender. So if you know literally everyone in the room identifies as a lady and as a gentleman, please do it. Please use it. 
But if you don't, I encourage you to practice using gender neutral language because it matters. It matters a lot. A matter of fact, it matters so much. It is literal suicide prevention. A study on youth showed that having their names and pronouns respected and affirmed at home, school, and work, and socially, all of those had to take place. 71 fewer symptoms of severe depression, 34% drop in reported suicidal thoughts and ideation, and a 65% decrease in suicide attempts. I was just writing a paper around Medicare, and I had to look up suicidal ideation am among trans and non-binary youth. 86%, 86% of trans and non-binary youth experience suicidal ideation. So if you get to the end of this, in which we're very close, we're like minutes away from the end of this, and you think, yeah, it's just not that big of a deal. It is. It is to someone else, so much so that it could be literally life-saving care. And I'd also challenge you, if you think it's not a big deal and your name isn't Susan, imagine me calling you Susan for the rest of your life. I bet you you'd get there, right? So this matters. So what are the ways, because this is about affirming actions, that you can model this? Anywhere your name shows up, your pronouns can, your Zoom profile, your email signature. If there's a name there, pronouns can be there. And then practice and do it out loud. It connects different neural pathways. It's a different muscle memory. Seems silly. I have a pronoun practice partner. I actually literally have someone who I call up and say, hey, I just met someone today. I want to build a good rapport. I want to make sure I'm affirming, but I'm not used to using these sets of pronouns. Can we practice? I've got kids. You're looking for like tips and tricks for little ones, for youth. We swap out names and pronouns in storybooks, right? For Cinderella, we'll use he, him, his pronouns. They, them, their pronouns as a way to practice using different sets of pronouns, right? fictional characters, they won't be hurt, right? And remember to do it out loud. The number two rule is apologize gracefully if you slip up. Can everyone makes mistakes? We're not perfect. I misgender people, right? It happens. But what we got to try to work towards is not assuming. And if we do misgender someone, apologize gracefully. So, this is a rhetorical question, but I'm gonna give you two apologies, apology A and apology B. And I want y'all to tell me which one is the better apology. Apology A, hey Javi, uh, you know, you came by earlier and I'm pretty sure I misgendered you. I just wanted to say, I'm really sorry. I'm working on it. I know that it matters. I have a pronoun practice partner. I call up, I try to practice up, uh, doesn't matter. Just wanted to let you know, I'm really sorry and I'm working on it. That's it. End of sentence. You move on and most importantly, you change your behavior. Apology B. And I'll tell you folks, I've done some epic apology Bs before in my personal life. So if I'm like hitting on some things for you, that's okay. I'm hitting on some things for me as well. Oh my God, Javi, I can't believe it. I did it again. I misgendered you, didn't I? I knew I was going to do it, Javi. I knew I was going to do it. I'm just kind of like a misgender. It's an identity and it's a part of who I am. I can't help it. That's who I am. Tay, the misgenderer. And I'm just always like, you're misgendered and you're misgendered and you're misgendered. I know this is virtual, but everyone look under your chair. <gasps> it's a misgender. Everyone gets it. Oh my God, I just misgendered. It's so funny because when I was born, let me talk to you about the whole story. When I was born, I was just going to misgender people. And then throughout the years, I misgender people. And I was misgendering people. I was misgendering people. Me, 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 me. More about me, 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 me. Which is kind of funny because I have an uncle who is non-binary. I have non-binary people in my life. And he uses they, them, their pronouns, which by the way is another misgender. And so I don't know why you are coming at me with this. I had good intentions, okay? I have trans people in my life, so I don't need you attacking me. I met well, okay? So it gets a little scary there at the end. 
but I hope that you can tell, apologia is how you apologize gracefully. You take accountability, you apologize, you move on, and most importantly, you change your behavior. Apology B is burden shifting, right? And it's embarrassing. I call it this concept of like you punch someone in the face and then you make them apologize that your hand hurts, right? So if you make a mistake, apology A folks, please. And then the last and final thing I have for y'all this afternoon is to speak up and help others when you and them slip up. It's not just enough for you to work on yourself, you have to help other people. So if you hear someone being misgendered, check in on them. Hey, Javi, how you doing? Are you okay? I heard you were misgendered earlier. Is there anything I can do to support? But also check in with the person who did the misgendering as well. Hey, I heard you misgendered Javi earlier today. I know you know how important it is. I struggle with it too. Do you want a pronoun practice partner? I know it helps me, right? So work on yourself, but also help others. So in closing, I just wanna say thank you so much.